Welcome, one and all, to the mystical world of Felbar. Adventures abound throughout this realm, and we appreciate the opportunity to regale you with some stories from these trails. These accounts are all based on actual RPG experiences that occurred within Adventures in Felbar. Some of these tales may be for mature audiences, while others may be for very immature audiences. We now present the sage Mikas Tumo from Tamel, also known as the Bard of Felbar. Welcome to session Fartook-18. In our last episode, a court hearing was held for the three captured criminals, and Lothar was about to see his fate at the end of a hangman's rope. The party was surprised when they discovered they too were to be charged, only with a trespass claim, despite their valiant efforts and success. Dingus Overmeyer arrived just in time to spare the party from their punishment. The party was rewarded and hailed as heroes. We rejoin them now as they stand in the empty hall of justice with Dingus and the orphans. Astonishment crossed the faces uh, at the glee of so much money. Another guard entered and presented Fargus with the scale mail worn by Lothar. He won't need this anymore, and the judge thought you might have a use for it, said the guard. Fargus admired the fine armor and then looked at the others with reservations. The group laughed and Lady Irena pointed out that he should keep it. It wouldn't fit any of them. He quickly stripped off his leather jerkin and slid the nice armor over his head. Whew, man, this fits good, he remarked as he twirled around. Welby and Sister Elaine then noticed the look on the children's faces as Dingus told them they had to return to their home. The children were obviously crestfallen at the news. Looking at each other, Welby groaned loudly yet again. <sighs> Dingus, how much would it be to get a property for the orphanage? asked Lady Irena. He thought for a moment and replied that he thought it would be about 400 crowns, but a certain mistress might be able to part with some property for 300 since she is ecstatic over having her dog return. The group nodded at each other and moved three bags over to the overjoyed Dingus. He attempted to decline, but the heroes would not hear of it. You just saved our skins, said Fargus. We owe you. Cabe looked at Welby and suggested that he turn over the silver key to Dingus as additional collateral, but the halfling declined. When pressed by the others, Welby admitted that he had traded the key for something else. What did you trade the key for? asked an exasperated Elaine. For this one, he proudly announced, as he withdrew a worn brass key with strange markings. The group leaned in and examined the different key and looked bewildered. Not much of a trade. The other one was silver, said a confused cave silver tongue. Dingus cleared his throat and asked to inspect the key, and it was promptly handed over to him. Where did you get this, if I may ask? Everyone's attention focused in on the diminutive adventurer who responded that he observed Commander What's-His-Face put it in Lothar's hand as they were leaving the Hall of Justice. The group looked at Dingus, who carefully examined the item, until Fargus asked him what it was. With furrowed brow, Dingus exhaled loudly and responded, <sighs> This is a key to the shackles used by the city guard, and it is very troubling. Silence fell over the group for several minutes until Lady Irena pensively worked it out. So Commander Roush gave Lothar a key to his chains? Why in the world would he do that? Dingus spoke to Welby and asked him if he could keep the key for a bit. The halfling groaned again and kicked at the floor. Man, I'm not going to get anything out of this, am I? And he promptly turned the key over. Dingus addressed the party. I cannot thank you enough, my friends. Your generosity and bravery are a beacon of hope in an otherwise bland landscape of our city. I must go now, but if you are ever in need of assistance, if we can provide it, we will be happy to help you. He then instructed the children to pick up the three bags of gold and led them out of the Hall of Justice. The group huddled up around the gold and reflected upon their first few days in Phoenix. Yep, said Cabe. 
I'm gonna own this town before it's all over. We'll have to change the name to Cave Land. No! Cave World! Has kind of a ring to it, doesn't it? The group looked on in profound skepticism until the bard came back to reality. Well, asked Fargus, what do we do next? Sister Elaine piped up and stated that she still needed to take the box of religious relics back to the temple, and Welby stated he still needed to find Gregor Finewire and give him that box that started this whole mess. He added that since Sister Elaine was the only one who could identify the man, he would rather stay with her. Cabe and Irena decided they wanted new clothes, and Fargus stated he was thirsty and needed to find a tavern. Sister Elaine pointed out that the church could hold up to 300 gold crowns and that they would be safe within the temple for a nominal fee. With no other options, aside from hiding the reward under a bed, the group agreed to pay the fee and move their treasure to the shrine. The group picked up the bags and traveled several blocks away to the temple, with several people recognizing them along the way and offering their gratitude. The group was puzzled as to how they were so easily identifiable until Lady Irena explained that they were an unusual collective to be walking in a group together. Looking at each other, they were satisfied with the answer, and the group arrived at the temple and were stopped at the gate. Sister Elaine turned to them and pointed out that they would not be allowed entry past the gate, and she would return a short time later. Arrangements were made to meet Welby within the hour at the posting totem, and then return Dockside to seek out Gregor and deliver the box. The other three also parted ways with Cabe and Irina seeking out the textile opportunities in town and Fargus looking for the first tavern to quench his thirst. The cleric directed the initiates to bring in the three bags of gold crowns into the treasury. There, she met with Brother Gellis and made arrangements to open an account with the church. Documentation was completed and a five crown surcharge was taken as payment for protecting the currency. She was advised that she would be the only one in charge and she, but needed to reference a segne, second signature in the event of her untimely demise. The cleric thought for a moment and said, I will add Lady Irena as the backup name. After the, completing the transaction, she obtained a second set of robes from the temple tailor and reached out for an audience with the high bishop. After ten minutes, she was ushered into the chamber where she had been a few days before. Back so soon, Reverend Daughter? inquired the religious leader, as he continued to speak with her and confirmed that he had already heard of her exploits in the sewers below. I am told that you have recovered some of our missing artifacts, Reverend Sister. Elaine smiled and turned over the box for examination. Shaking his head, the High Bishop was obviously distressed. These rogues have no idea what they had in their possession. Foolish, foolish men, I tell you. You have done well, my dear, and Dilo's light certainly shines upon you. She thanked the leader for his kind words and excused herself, pointing out that she had to help one of her friends find a man. The high bishop inquired who it was and was told. Shaking his head, he pursed his lips pensively. You certainly do things to find out the best and the worst people. Puzzled about his response, she asked him what he meant, and he explained that Gregor Finewire is a well-known underworld figure and can be quite dangerous. He asked her to describe the box in question, but it didn't ring any bells with him. Use caution, Reverend Daughter, and tell your associate to mind his hands before they get him into more trouble. Sister Elaine thanked him for his assistance, kissed his ring, and made her way to the door before being stopped. Turning, she caught a large leather wallet that the High Bishop had tossed to her. Confused, she opened it to find five vials of a light blue fluid. Looking up, she saw the leader smile thinly. Good health to you, Sister Elaine. She bowed again and made her way outside of the temple grounds to go meet with Welby O'Toole. We close out this episode now and give you our thanks for listening. Please subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to follow us on Twitter at The Bards Podcast. For everyone in Adventures of Philbar, thanks for listening.